My name is Matt Myers. I'm the Dean of the Cox School of Business here at SMU, and I wanted to make sure to welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, Texas Economic Forum that's sponsored by uh, the O'Neill Center for Global Markets. It's a real pleasure to be here. We're glad you're here. We've got some folks that are still uh, coming in from work. Uh, the folks that are actually making uh, Texas the uh, top economy inside the United States, according to the Wall Street Journal yesterday. So we'll have some folks wander in here over the next few minutes. But I just wanted to give you all my welcome. We're so glad that you all are here at Cox and at SMU. We're very proud of our institution, very proud of our campus. And as you can tell, it's a beautiful place to spend our time. So welcome to you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Knox, who heads up the uh, Alumni and External Relations for the Cox School of Business. Uh, please join me in welcoming Kevin. Thank you, Dean Myers. It is a great day to be on campus, is it not? Sun's out, birds are singing. We're here together. Glad to have you. I want to add my welcome to you to the fourth Texas Economic Forum. As Dean Myers said, it's being sponsored by the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom, which is one of our research groups inside the Cox School of Business. The O'Neill Center was founded 10 years ago with a gift from William J. O'Neill, who was a 1957 graduate of SMU and the Cox School. Bill, as we call him, became one of America's foremost investment gurus. The center's mission is to research on the fundal, fundamental questions of a political economy. Why do some nations prosper and grow and other nations remain poor? With us today is Bob Lawson. He is the O'Neill Center's current director. Bob is over here. Welcome, Bob. Michael Cox is also here. He was the O'Neill Center's, right here is Michael, welcome, founding director. And you're going to hear from Michael in just a bit when he gets a chance to do his presentation. The purpose of the Texas Economic Forum is to simply learn about the state's economy and be able to share our ideas together. Today's topic is both current and controversial. Our speakers will give their thoughts on Trump and the Texas economy. They'll consider how Texas might be impacted by the president's policies on trade, taxes, immigration, and energy. So here's the format. Each of our four speakers will have 15 minutes to discuss their topic. After the last speaker finishes, I'll bring them back up here, and they'll uh, set uh, uh, as a panel for question and answers. We'll do our best to stay on schedule, so turn your cell phones off. The restrooms are in the foyer. Uh, after the Q&A, everyone is invited to join us out there for a reception, uh, and the, our speakers will be there as well. I'm also supposed to add no one under 21 is allowed to have a beer. So we have that out of, a way, out of the way. Our first speaker is Vance Ginn. Vance from Austin is the director of the Center of, for Economic Prosperity and is a senior economist at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. The TPPF is one of the nation's top free market think tanks. At the TPPF, Vance has produced in-depth research on the benefits of restraining government spending, cutting and eliminating taxes, and abolishing government barriers to competition. So he's going to start us off today with his presentation, which is called, Will Trade Protection Make Texas Poor? Did I get that right, Vance? Okay. Batter up. You're on. All right. Welcome, thank Vance. You, thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's always a, a nice day to be up at SMU, beautiful campus. Uh, as a Red Raider, it's good to get around every once in a while. So don't hold that against me. OK, all right, good, good. Um, so today I'd like to start out a little bit on um, how it just, it's a little bit about Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, we've been around since 1989, cover a number of different areas. Um, TexasPolicy.com is our website. Our mission, our core mission is based on um, free enterprise, liberty, and personal responsibility, key issues that support economic prosperity over time. So I'd like to start off first by talking, how, talking about how institutions matter. And 
the kind of the, the, the train of thought in my mind and when I'm doing research is to start off with Adam Smith, where he talked about absolute advantage, the wealth of nations, this sort of thing. And, and you move to, to Hayek, um, his issues with knowledge problems, some other areas of government. James Buchanan talked about public, cho public choice economics, and even Douglas North talked about how institutions matter overall. And there was a good book that I read a few years ago called Why Nations Fail. Maybe many, some of you have read it uh, by Elsa Moglu and Robinson. And it really went into a lot of the details and the historical evidence of how institutions really matter. And I know even in, among each one of you, including myself, the institutional structure that you went through within your life influenced who you are today. Mine started off of a humble background growing up in South Houston, Texas, with my dad who had epilepsy, uh, and, my, and so he's on disability, and my mom who was, worked at a daycare. You know, I didn't have a lot of income, but we made things work. Uh, I went to private school from kindergarten to second grade, public school from third grade to sixth grade, and homeschool from seventh grade through twelfth grade. So I kind of got the mix of all of them, if you will. Um, taught at Sam Houston State University for a couple of years. I played in a rock band for a while. Um, uh, we were one of the top five rock bands in Houston, um, if you can imagine that back then. Uh, I got in a really serious car accident, changed my life from here on out. And now I'm here with all of you great people and get to do some things that I hope to make Texans and really Americans and just people in general be more prosperous. But if you think about the times in your life that you went through institutions, and how that changed you for the better, and some things maybe not for the better, but you learn from them. And I think that the same thing when we talk about economic institutions as well, that we need to learn from our mistakes. And we've made plenty throughout human history, even here in the United States. Um, and when you look at this sort of institutions on this scale, you see extractive institutions, which are those of like, you know, when you include communism, dictatorships, socialism, those that extract resources from some to give to others. So there's some distortions that happen in the economy, and we see slower economic growth and less prosperity among those types of institutions. Inclusive institutions are more of those that we think about as capitalism, democracy, the republic that we're blessed to live in. Those sort of things allow for people to be more prosperous and really flourish over time. Um, and so when we look at this, and, and I really build a lot on what's going on with the economic freedom of the world, and, and think about the institutional structure that's there. Um, Bob Lawson, one of the authors of the report here, and there's a lot of great information in there on how institutions really matter, right? And so, you, so what we see is that the United States has had some issues whenever you rank the United States compared to the other countries, 157 countries in this most recent report. Back in 2000, the United States was ranked fourth most free, right? But now there's been this downward trend to now we're ranked 11th. And when we see that, we also see that in some of our economic results that we've had in the United States as well. Um, and so when you, you know, look at size of government is one of the variables in there. We ranked 80th. Legal system and property rights, 22nd. Sound money, 7th. Free trade, 63rd. Ouch. And this was a couple years ago. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what upcoming reports show. Uh, and regulation, 5th. So what about fiscal policy? Looking at that institutional framework, what we've seen is that there's been a large increase in the national debt. The national debt is now $21 trillion, but that's not including Social Security and Medicare. If you include the unfunded liabilities from those, it's closer to, some estimates put it up to $100 trillion. But $21 trillion is already more than 100% of our gross domestic product, the total output of our economy. A lot of research shows that if you give above 80% to 90% of GDP as your national debt, you have to start having slower economic growth, less job creation, and things of that nature. So here we see government spending increasing and also a large increase in the, in the, in the federal debt. Monetary policy, another one of the institutional frameworks that we've had. Um, and what I've done here is looked at the blue line that goes like this, long period of low interest rates. Um, and then the green line here, so this is the federal funds rate, all right? You can't see it, maybe clip farther in the back. And the green line is what the Taylor rule, which is basically looks at the output gap. How far are we, when we're growing a GDP, how far are we from our potential? And what's the inflation gap? 
What's the inflation rate compared to our long-term trend? And the Taylor rule, rule is kind of a guide that shows you what federal funds rate might, maybe, maybe what should it be? And there's some research that shows back in 2003-04 when interest rates were 1%, that we kept rates too low for too long, which contributed to the housing market bubble, or boom, bubble, and then, and then burst later on, part of the financial crisis that resulted thereafter. Now we have a period where we have 0% interest rates for a long period of time, essentially seven years, and the, federal fund, the, the Taylor Rule says that maybe we should have had something higher than that. So if this period, short period here, led to some bubbles and that eventually bust, burst, what's, what's going on here? And when you look at quantitative easing, I think there's some economic evidence that shows that that wasn't effective and contributing to more economic growth. So also seems to be some institutional structural problems that we have at the federal level. So what are some of the results that we see here of these federal institutions? Well, we've had the slowest economic recovery since World War II. The pace is starting to pick up some, but the average annual growth rate has only been 2.1%. And the average of the last essentially 100 years has been closer to 3%, right? So it doesn't seem like this boost, this stimulus, if you will, has really worked. Uh, standard of livings over this decade from 2007 to 2017, population has increased by 8%. So if the population increases, maybe we would see some increase in food stamp recipients, but a 62% increase over that period? What about poverty level? Poverty is up 14%. And SSDI recipients up 24%. So some of the things we look at right now, and even the unemployment rate that was reported last week, the U3 report, um, um, indicator shows that we're at 3.9% unemployment rate. You have to go back to December of 2000 to find that low of an unemployment rate. So another measure that I like to look at is the U6 unemployment rate that includes under, um, um, underemployed and discouraged workers. That's currently 7.8%. Back in December 2000, 2000 well, it was, it was at 6.8%, a full percentage point below where it's at today. Um, and some other indicators out there as well. So with all that said, what I think we need to look at is how other institutions might work and maybe get some, glean some things from, from what has worked by looking at the states. And that's really what a lot of more of my research does before I looked at NAFTA specifically here recently in a paper that's out there on the table. Maybe you can grab a copy. It's also on our website. Um, when you take the four largest states, California, Texas, Florida, and New York, and you look at the economic freedom of North America, um, which is another one of the authors here, Dean Stanzel, is, he, he, he looks at the, it's kind of the same thing with government spending, taxation, and regulation, and compares these on a state-by-state -state basis. In the latest report for 2015, Texas and Florida were tied with second most free. Right? California and New York were the two worst in the United States. So that might give you some indication of where they might rank when it comes to economic variables as well. So there's the economic freedom of North America, second, second. So the blue here tells you which state has the best in each one of these economic variables, and the red is the worst. So state business tax climate index, according to the Tax Foundation, Texas ranks 13th. We like to be first, right? Uh, not, not 13th. We rank 13th. Part of that has to do with our high um, burden of the business margins tax, also called the franchise tax, which we've been working on to try to reduce and eventually eliminate. Florida actually ranks fourth best here. State and local tax burden, we have the fourth um, best there. But another measure to look at is the employment to population ratio, 25 to 54 year olds, really looking at that prime age working years. Um, Florida has the highest, we have the second highest. Total civilian employment from December of 2007 to December of 2017, since the last Great Recession, if you will, to now, Texas has created 24% of all jobs created nationwide, right? And even if you look at some measures of income inequality, like the top 10% of income shares, Texas has the lowest share, even though California has the highest income tax rate of 13.3% in the nation. New York is second highest, 11.1%. What are some of the reasons for them having such a high income tax rate? Well, it's to redistribute income. And that's actually not making their system more equal, as shown by the top 10% of income shares. Um, so the American dream is not dead. It just simply moved to the Lone Star State, right? But so how can, we, how can we make D.C., though, look more like Texas? 
right? We can't really do anything with monetary policy until we, you know, have some other issues there. Um, <laughs> I won't get into that right now. But a regulatory, I think there's some things that we can see by the Trump administration and what's happened in D.C. that have been positive. When you look at regulatory reform, last year definitely beat my expectations of what they were going to do with regulations. Cutting 16 for every new one that's been added. When you look at the rollback of the Clean Power Plan, the Affordable Care Act is still there. They got rid of the individual mandate, but still the regulations are in place which are a huge cost. What are we going to do with Dodd-Frank? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in December, I think that was also a net positive, even though it wasn't perfect, but there was a net positive there. But there's this problem now with spending, <laughs> and that's been a problem for a long time by the federal government. Spending drives taxes, not taxes drive spending. So we've got to really control spending, or this debt burden is going to continue to rise um, over time. But... There's been a lot of uncertainty with what's happening with trade, right? And so this, this research that I've done, and I have some academic paper on this as well, is that trade is really between people among countries. We talk a lot about how, well, we have a trade deficit, right? The United States has a trade deficit with Mexico. But it's not that Mexico trades with the U.S., and the U.S. doesn't trade with Canada. Texans or Americans trade with Mexicans, right? And Americans trade with Canadians. And they would not trade had they not both benefited from this exchange. And so to me, the trade deficit is kind of this arbitrary number. Really, when you look at it, for example, with Texas, trade with Mexico and Canada is $228 billion when you sum up the imports and, e and exports. That's the balance of payments. That's what's benefiting, allowing for people to satisfy their desires. Now, you can go in and say, well, Mexico is doing this or the US is doing that. But let's also look internally of where we can say, all right, this is raising our cost of production. When we had the highest corporate income tax rate in the developed world at 35%, they lowered it to 21%, allowing us to be below the worldwide average of 22.5%. That allows you to be more competitive, right? Um, Texas has been the top export state now for 16 years. That's good. But we've also imported a lot. And importing is also allows us to keep prices low, allows for entrepreneurs to be able to invest and look into the future. Um, and you, this might also surprise some of you. Our top good that we export is actually computer and electronics. It's IT. It's not petroleum um, in that specific category. Also part of this research that I've done is looked at the diversification of the, of the Texas economy, which has been contributed to by NAFTA as we've been able to expand our markets We've been able to expand the professional services sector, expand in the healthcare sector, a number of other sectors that are out there. And so we've seen this kind of divergence between oil prices and the mining share of the Texas economy. I run out of time, so I can get into that a little bit later. You know, what's up with the tariffs? Whenever you're putting tariffs on China, for example, on steel, this is the share of steel. These are the, the black lines of the share of steel that we import from different countries. This is China. It's not much, right? This is Canada over here. Aluminum, a little bit more from China, but still not a lot. And what we do see is that these are the number of jobs in the aluminum and, and steel direct jobs to those industries compared with the steel consuming industries. There are many more jobs that are there that are already being hurt by the higher steel prices that are out there. And so I think that's a huge cost. And I've already been talking to some business folks who say that, look, that uncertainty with tariffs and NAFTA is contributing to slower economic growth, and they're not investing as much into the future. So keys to making the U.S. look more like Texas, continue regulatory reform, restrain spending, restrain spending, restrain spending, and make tax cuts permanent, stop trade protectionism, action, and rhetoric. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. I hope you will have a chance when you're sitting on the panel to go over some of the, more of that presentation. It's very interesting. Next uh, on the docket is our good friend Doug McCullough. Doug is a corporate attorney and has a tax firm, Texas, ta uh, Texas uh, law firm, McCullough, and do you say Sudan? Sudan. Sudan. Okay. His practice includes mergers and acquisitions, international business, and taxation. In December, he joined the Lone Star Policy Institute, 
which is a newly formed research center focusing on free market solutions to state and local issues. So his presentation today is going to be taxes, tariffs, and tweets, the three T's. Doug, come forward. Let's welcome Doug. Thank you all for having me today. Um, as we were scheduling this, or as I realized the date, I also realized that this is the, I guess, the 20th anniversary of me graduating from SMU School of Law, the uh, LLM program. So I guess, for personally, for me, it's a bit of a reunion. Um, <laughs> So, um, as, as we mentioned, we um, just recently formed a new think tank called the Lone Star Policy Institute. We're a free market think tank f focused primarily on city and state issues, but because uh, trade is so important to Texas, we also dabble a little bit in, in international trade. Um, and for my time today, I'm going to focus primarily on tax, trade, and energy policy. Um, there will be uh, references to tweets, though. Um, as we judge economic policy, it's not a question, of, in my mind, of whether or not we like Donald Trump. It's a question of, does the economic policy promote prosperity, competition, and innovation? And so in my time, uh, I want to get started first uh, with the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Um, most of the, the major changes are going to be on the uh, corporate and international side, but starting with the individual side, um, most individuals will be seeing a tax rate cut. The approach was to reduce rates across the board for most individuals, but also sort of claw that back a little bit by, by some, by as we say, broadening the base. Some of the positive changes. Um, and for the individuals, on the individual side, is um, the standard deduction is nearly doubled. We've expanded the child uh, tax credit. Um, one thing that's sort of neutral, but I guess positive in the fact, in the fact that nothing changed, uh, there was talk of eliminating the charitable deduction, um, but for those of us involved with nonprofits, thankfully, there was no change there. Some of the, I guess you could say, sort of uh, net negative for, uh, for us taxpayers, um, but sort of offsetting the rate cuts is uh, the personal exemption was eliminated. Again, this is because the standard deduction was nearly doubled. Um, and then some somewhat controversial moves. The, um, there's some limitations on the mortgage interest deduction at $750,000, which was down from a million dollars, um, as well as um, a, uh, a limitation on the deduction for state and local tax. Now, by comparison to individuals on the coasts, um, blue states, um, that have a higher um, state tax um, and also likely to have a higher um, real estate cost, Texas did f fairly well by comparison because our real estate tends to be a little bit lower, so having the uh, uh, lower cap on the mortgage interest deduction may not affect us quite as much. And the um, the state and local tax cap doesn't affect us as much since we don't have a state income tax. But on balance, most individuals are going to be seeing a, um, a reduction in their overall tax. And again, this is, you know, judging this based on is this, uh, you know, does this give uh, individuals more uh, economic autonomy? Does this create more prosperity? I think on balance this is positive. But the real uh, exciting news is more on the business side and the corporate side. Um, and without getting deep into the details, um, as Vance mentioned, the corporate rates have gone from 35 percent down to 21 percent. When the um, when the news broke about the, the bill being signed into law, uh, you may have seen headlines about raises and bonuses and, and such. But, and obviously this can continue, there's going to be more dollars left in corporate, corporations for them to do more things. But in addition to benefiting employees, this creates opportunities for more capital expenditures, building more plants, building more facilities, in, improving um, research and development, um, and frankly, just making the United States a more competitive place to do business. And so on balance, this is something that I think is very pro-growth um, that will really benefit the, uh, the United States. Um, on the international side, 
um, some very complicated rules when it comes to um, uh, the changes on the international side. In the past, we've had a, uh, a system where corporations are taxed on the worldwide income, and we're moving now to a, a territorial system. But as part of that, there is something that's sort of a, uh, it's been loosely called a tax amnesty. There's a, through a carrot and a stick type of arrangement, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's incentives to re repatriate between one to three trillion dollars that are held by U.S. companies offshore. And under the new rules, over a course of eight years, uh, corporations will be taxed at a rate of about 15 percent for repatri repatriating those dollars back in the United States, whether or not they actually return those dollars back to the United States. The, the sort of carrot and stick there is the benefit is in the past this would have been a 35 percent tax rate. So now there's a much lower rate to return these dollars back into the back in the U.S. economy. The stick there is is whether or not they actually do move those dollars back to the United States. They'll be taxed at it on it. But on balance, this is something that is going to be bringing in additional additional dollars for investment, R&D, acquisitions, more capital expenditures in the U.S. economy. Um, and uh, recently, Apple has already announced that they are moving about uh, $285 billion back into, into the U.S., and I'm sure others will, other companies will follow suit. Um, actually, back up. On, on, the, um, on the international side as well, um, there is a, uh, in the past, you may have seen, uh, heard about uh, sort of these exotic Irish Dutch sandwiches and things like this if you're into tax law, where p corporations would move their intellectual property offshore. Um, you'd have companies like Microsoft, Google, and others that went through these elaborate structures trying to avoid as much taxation as possible. Well, we've through these new rules, we're trying to become more competitive internationally with our tax rules and trying to discourage that. And now competing with some of the um, more, frankly, aggressive, more competitive rates that places like um, the UK and Ireland have, there's now, if you qualify, there's a possibility of, of developing and commercializing technology in the United States and only being taxed on, on the uh, international income from that at 13%. Um, and so this is something, again, that makes us much more competitive internationally. It should spark more innovation here in the United States. I mean, this is good for Texas um, because we, this could be, you know, I just think about all the different industries that we have across the state. Um, Austin with their startups. Uh, there's diverse industry here. I mean, Houston, we have a lot of industry in um, energy and, and life sciences. And so this is encouraging more of that R&D to be done here in commercializing the um, that technology. Um, one of the areas that is getting, uh, uh, it's probably un overlooked in the tax package, is an uh, opportunity to zone. Um, opp so some of you may be familiar years ago with Jack Kemp's ideas of an empowerment zone. It's sort of a similar concept. Um, it's been described as um, as p potentially ha having the potential of being the, the largest uh, community economic development plan in the nation. Um, it and it's I've seen one estimate that it could involve six trillion dollars being moved into distressed in distressed areas. What it does in a nutshell is it provides tax incentives and sometimes deferment and even uh, eliminating tax by long-term investments. There's more tax benefit to the it, to the extent that it's a long-term investment held in a distressed area, um, and so this is something that I think could create a lot of, could sort of spread the opportunities um, in more economically distressed areas. Um, just touching on sort of in general what the economic impact is, according to the, um, the Tax Foundation, they estimate there'll be a 1.7 percent increase to the national GDP and up to 339,000 jobs created through the tax plan. Um, that's the good news. Um, the, on the negative side, um, they say that there will be $1.47 trillion of a budget shortfall adding to the debt um, from a static perspective. And on a more dynamic budgeting, it would be more like $448 uh, billion adding to the, adding to the national debt. Um, and that's something that fiscal conservatives used to care about was the budget. Um, 
Let's move a little bit to, to trade. I know Vance spent a lot of time talking about trade. Uh, from my perspective, if you believe in free market economics, you should be a free trader. Um, if you believe that free market economics create prosperity, there's really nothing different about free trade. It just happens to cross international borders. Um, and as, as Vance has already pointed out, Texas benefits from trade because we're the, the largest exporter in the, in the United States. But this administration hasn't been a free trade administration. They are, um, they, appro they approach free trade, I mean, approach trade from protectionism, which is to protect local businesses, local companies and industries from international competition. The rationale for, for um, um, <laughs> sorry, the rationale for uh, protectionism um, it, 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 by this administration is this idea of a, of a trade deficit. So what's a trade deficit? Essentially, it's the difference between exports minus imports. Um, but as Vance has already pointed out, sorry, just you've, you've taken all my best lines. Sorry. Uh, so um, nations don't trade. And so one of, the, one of the problems with talking about a trade deficit is that it's sort of a snapshot in time of trade between two different countries. But that's not the way trade happens globally. There's trade with all individuals and companies around the world, and not to mention the financial side of the, in, the financial investment that comes back. But worldwide, this balances. And it's not just trade shouldn't be just viewed as just a snapshot between two countries. And as I mentioned, I have a trade deficit with SMU. I don't have any complaints about this. I paid a lot of money to get a degree, and it's, and it's helped me advance in my career. But this is the nature of trade. We, two parties entered into it. I was willing to pay the tuition, and I benefit, benefited from it. So recently, there was a, uh, a woman's picture on Twitter that um, sort of went viral. She was wearing, a, not this t-shirt, she was wearing a t-shirt that said, tariffs are great. Um, and this sort of sparked a reaction where um, some free traders created their own t-shirt. And part of the problem was trying to explain the, the in opposition to just uh, free trade is great. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit longer of an explanation <laughs> of why tariffs are not great. So as a t-shirt says, tariffs not only impose immense economic costs, but also fail to achieve their primary policy aims and foster political dysfunction along the way. So some of the uh, some of the costs there, um, um, some of the costs there is not only are consumer goods going to cost more, but also the inputs. Um, Scott Linscombe from Cato is uh, who actually it's his quote on the T-shirt uh, has estimated that over 50 percent of you of imports into the United States are actually inputs. So it's materials that are going into what are eventually going to become U.S. products. So as, as we add tariffs, as we increase the cost um, of those materials, we're also increasing the cost of, U of U.S. goods, uh, making them more expensive, making us less competitive. Um, if you can read the sign, that's Stuart Varney, apparently. Um, so it's been estimated that, by, again, by the Tax Foundation, that um, Texas alone um, could be spending $1 billion more per year just based on tariffs. Um, steel tariffs, um, in particular, um, would have a direct impact. We'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Steel tariffs would have an impact on Texas in the energy industry. Um, it's used in pipelines. It's used in drill pipe, pipeline equipment, machinery. Um, and that's before we even start talking about the retaliation that inevitably happens. And if you read the news, you see that China and the EU, in, in response to the, the tariffs that we're proposing, are proposing their own. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about NAFTA. Uh, the idea of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, goes back to Ronald Reagan. So the, the idea of, the, of NAFTA is a common market where there's no um, restrictions, no quotas. Um, and, but recently, um, the, the president has suggested that we might pull out of NAFTA. Um, he, the president has made it quite clear that he's not a fan of NAFTA. And again, the part of the problem with pulling out of NAFTA is the retaliation. If we pull out of NAFTA, then, then the we could expect that not only would consumer goods be more expensive, not only would inputs be more expensive, but we would expect that, that uh, retaliation of, of, the, uh, um, of their duties. Um, but with that, I think I will just end early. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Doug. And we'll give you another opportunity down there on the, on the panel. So next to the podium is my good friend, Michael Cox. Michael, I have great friends with him for a number of years here, know his whole family, glad to have him here with us. He ended his 25-year career at the uh, Federal Reserve of Dallas in 2008, and we scooped him up as quickly as we could, and he became the founding director of the O'Neill Center here at the Cox School. In 2015, he returned to his first love of teaching and research and now heads the center's program on the study of the Texas economy. So today he is going to answer, ad address the question, will immigration policy lead to labor shortages? Welcome, Michael Cox. So I am going to talk about labor market, but first, let me just say one thing about trade, because I believe the strongest argument for trade is, is, is a moral one. Trade is a basic human right. If I have an apple and you have an orange and we want to trade, it's nobody else's business but ours, whether we do it. That's simple. Unless we hurt, we're not hurting anybody, why, should, why shouldn't we be allowed to do it? All right. <clears throat> Will immigration policy lead to labor shortages? And I'm going to focus here on Texas, because I love Texas. How many, I haven't asked this in a long time. How many people here were born in Texas? Uh, okay, so about a third. We're all immigrants from some other place. <laughs> Me from Arkansas. All right, here is GDP growth over a 17-year period in a growth rate on the vertical axis, a 17-year growth rate, and the absolute addition to gross domestic product state, which we call, we should call it GSP, gross state product, over that 17-year time period. You can see the Texas miracle up there with 63% growth, the highest amongst the 10 biggest states in the country. We didn't add the most to GDP, California did, 747 billion, but they're bigger than us. Their growth rate was a fraction, was about two-thirds of our growth rate. But everybody else lags behind, especially those New York and, and some, of the, some of the old industrial states. Adding, so we are growing rapidly here and adding a tremendous amount to GDP. Of course, that's not possible without people to come work and having a labor force. As, I, as you can see here, as the labor force has grown, so has GDP here in Texas. Texas, over the 18 or so years from uh, the end of 2000, of the end of the year 2000, up until February of this year, had by far the most jobs in the nation, approaching 3 million jobs. Uh, and that, up to this point, is about 20% of the total jobs added. Now, there was a time, not more than about five years ago, where we added more than 50% of the jobs in the nation since the year 2000. So we've been a very strong economy. That's the Texas miracle. And just here we are adding $40,500 500 more jobs just in a month. An enormous amount of job creation. I'm from Little Rock. I had a population of 165,000 when I was born, about 185,000 now. So that's 67 years worth of um, population growth in my little town. Every 14 months, Dallas-Fort Worth adds a city the size of Little Rock. So that's how fast we're growing here just in Dallas-Fort Worth. Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston have been the fastest growing job areas for America. You can see the number of jobs we added here in Dallas-Fort Worth over this 16-year time period. You see the number we added in Houston, Dallas tended to add ours in the suburbs and in Fort Worth and not so much in the inner city. I could go off on that for a while. It all goes back to incentives and taxes and so on and the quality of the schools. But if you add to this, also Austin and San Antonio, these are the 30 biggest uh, metropolitan areas in America. You can see we lead the nation in job growth, us and Houston. Of course, Houston got hurt by um, the oil downturn and by uh, the uh, recent Hurricane Harvey. Um, now here in Dallas, it's just focusing on Dallas-Fort Worth, our area. This is where we've added the jobs up north. You know this, up in Frisco, up in Prosper. 
next to Salina, McKinney, Allen, uh, but not Dallas per se so much. But we're having this booming local economy, adding thousands and thousands of jobs all, all the time. Focusing in on the uh, outward from the D Dallas Fort Worth economy to the Texas Triangle, which, you know, is Dallas down to Houston, over to San Antonio, up through Austin, and so on, also includes Kylie, Waco, College Station, and so on, has about 10% of the state's, less than 10% of the state's land mass geographically inside this area, okay? Yet, it has 71% of the state's population, about 74% of the state's employment, 75% of the state's personal income, and 80% of the gross state product is it produced inside this Texas Triangle. So this is the, the mega growth area of the, of the Southwest. And when people move to Texas, come in from California, wherever they come to, they typically decide to move inside this Triangle. What do they do? Where do these people work? They work, number one, industry, professional, and business services, the largest share. That, that industry captures the largest share of output produced in the state. About 85% of the state's uh, output of professional business services is produced in the triangle. And at the other end, of course, is agriculture. Um, only 5% or so. I don't know. Who grows anything in these cities? I don't know. But mining, <laughs> mining is 40-something percent at the other end, too. So professional business services, wholesale trade information, as you can see, all industry total 85, 80%. That's uh, the, what, what is produced in the triangle. But here, look, here's, you know this. There is no Texas miracle. There is no booming Texas triangle. There is no number one and number two performing MSAs in the country, which we're beloved to hear over and over again. There's none of that apart from getting the workers that we need right here at home. The Texas labor market is very, very tight. Now, I'm sorry for all bumping up around the data, but the, the data for MSAs, and this is MSA data, is not seasonally adjusted, which means it wobbles over the seasons. But Texas data is seasonally adjusted. Our unemployment rate in Texas in uh, March was 4%. Now, at the national level, the unemployment rate has come down two percentage points. And we are, tend to run about two percentage points below the nation. So probably in the state now, if we look to April, we're looking at a 3.8% <coughs> unemployment rate for Texas, a 2.9% unemployment rate for Austin, a 3.3% 3, 3, uh, unemployment rate for San Antonio, and 35 for Dallas. Houston has a relatively high unemployment relative among the state, but that's because you know, Houston got hit with Katrina, but even, I mean, I'm sorry, with uh, Harvey, but even the Houston market is now recovering. The slack in the Houston labor market itself is even once again disappearing. You can see that Houston's job growth was fairly strong, right up there with everybody else's, until the oil price decline hit, and then they started to grow strong again, until then, then Hurricane Harvey hits. Now they came back down to zero job growth, but now they're, over the past six months, um, job growth in Houston has been the strongest amongst the MSAs other than Austin. So the labor market in Texas is tightening up even in Houston. Which brings me to the main point here. How important are foreign-born workers to the Texas labor force? So let's put it in perspective. This graph shows you the percentage of workers in the state, employed workers in the state, that are foreign-born. The first bar here are workers that come from Mexico. The top bar is California. The gold come from Mexico, the brown, other Latin American countries. And then the pink is uh, other foreign born, not from Latin America, okay? So Texas here is sixth on the list in terms of foreign born workers, but we are second on the list in terms of the number, I'm, I'm third on the list, and I'm sorry, second on the list in terms of the percentage the share of our workers that come from Mexico. So we're very, we're very intimately linked to, to workers coming from Mexico. The gold bar is what I'm talking about there. So Latin, bo uh, workers born in Latin America are very important to the Texas economy, but specifically Mexico. Overall, now let's compare Texas and every one of these industries, I'm going to compare United States to Texas. I'm sorry. 
this is Texas. This is the United States. All right. So what you can see here is that overall, in, in a Texas, about 23%, 22% of our labor force is foreign-born. Foreign-born, coming from these places I've described. However, if you want to know, okay, where are the foreign-born workers working the most, you know it. They're in construction. If you're going to move here from a California um, and you expect to enjoy Texas low cost of living, you're only going to do that if you can afford a house, and you're only going to be able to afford a house if, you, if the workers are here to make it and make it affordable. And if what we have here is not just in residential, but in commercial real estate, commercial in the construction industry, it's heavily dependent upon foreign born workers, particularly workers from Mexico. So the construction industry is really extremely important. I mean, how can you have a miracle economy if folks can't even come here and, and afford to live here? All right, now let's turn to U.S. construction. So let's focus on construction and turn to construction workers, uh, country and region of birth. In Texas, nearly 400,000 of workers in the year two, uh, 2016 in the overall industry, in the construction industry, Nearly 400,000 came from Mexico. A few other came from Latin America and so other foreign born. Uh, the rest came from the United States. But you can see the heavy concentration of, say, Mexican workers and other Latin American workers in the Texas economy. In percentage terms, we also rank first in terms of the share that are born in Mexico. It was absolute numbers first and percentage terms first as well. Now, let me get. Uh, we don't have data on foreign born workers of what they what specific occupations they take but we do have data on uh, the, the occupations that people go into uh, by race or ethnic group and so let me focus on Hispanics which is probably the closest thing I can get to the uh, po more working population and, and of immigrants in, in Texas well what did uh, Hispanic folks do in the construction industry 63% of the drywall installers are Hispanic. 52% of roofers of the, of the roofers are Hispanic. 51% of the people who around the nation who install carpet, floor, and tile, and so on are Hispanic. And you can see that same thing on down the line. And if I, if I could get these numbers for Texas, these are for the nation as a whole, you can bet they'd be a lot, lot, lot higher. I mean, I've got some property up on 380, two pieces of property on, north, on the north side of 380 between McKinney and uh, Denton. And I mean, it's just almost impossible to get a worker now up there. Uh, they're, and the ones you can get are very expensive because most of the workers in this industry come from Latin America, Mexico in particular, and the supply of these folks is at, at, uh, absolutely dwindling. That was focusing on the construction industry, but you can see other industries, other jobs that the Hispanic folks have, such as cooks, groundskeepers, maids, and so on, very important to our industry and to the affordability of things that we all enjoy. Where do new Mexican immigrants who obtain legal per permanent residence in this country choose to reside? All right, so you're coming in from Mexico to America, and you have, where, where am I going to go? Where I choose to go? Over this five-year period, 97, 8, 9, five years, including the endpoints, you can see that California was the state of choice, the number one state of choice for most of the, uh, for the Mexican uh, immigrants, lawful immigrants, but Texas was second. And together, us in California got more than half of, of the passel of people who came in from Mexico. So we're both, both heavily dependent upon Mexico. And that same trend has continued uh, as we go forward, even more so for Texas and California. The, the fraction that we were coming here from other is going down. Now, let's focus just on Texas. What is the country of birth of Texas's lawful new immigrants? Back in this, over this five-year period, half of the workers coming to Texas 
half of the immigrants coming from abroad, from Mexico, and half from elsewhere. It's about the same, uh, it's a fewer, more people now, but a smaller share. We're getting an increasing share of our foreign workers from elsewhere. So Texas, Mexico ties are extremely important to Texas. Uh, of course, this is important. And of course, the labor market is tightening here. Uh, and this is why I want to give some credit to a new center that's been started here. Um, the Texas Mexico Center, several of us, including Dean, Dean Myers, went down to Mexico City about, and Rick here a couple of weeks ago, Dean gave a paper down there and where we focused on the importance of the Texas Mexico relationship to the prosperity of Texas. But that's it. So thank you for your attention, for your time. Thank you, Michael. Next on the po to come up to the podium is going to be Merrill Matthews. Merrill Matthews' email address is policyguy1. So he's the right person to end the program today. He is a resident scholar with the Institute of Policy Innovation, which is a research-based public policy think tank in Irving. He is a health policy expert and a contributor for Forbes.com. He also, he also serves on the Texas Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. So today he's going to be discussing Texas, Trump, and energy. Please welcome this gentleman. All right, so Texas, Trump, and energy. Uh, well, I want to thank Mike for inviting me to come here and all the great work the O'Neill Center does. Uh, it is a, a sort of a beacon of free market policies out here in an academic world that isn't always focused on free market policies these days. Texas, Trump, and energy. Oh, let me mention what IPI. I, Institute for Policy Innovation was founded 30 years ago by Dick Armey. Uh, he severed his ties in 1984 when he became majority leader, so he's not had any connection with us since then. But we have tried to maintain his vision of pro-growth economic policies and limited government. Uh, I subtitled my speech here, Two Steps Forward and One Step Back, Maybe. So, two steps. How many of you are familiar with the Texas Two-Step? <laughs> So you got two quick steps and two long steps. Step, 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 step. Well, when I did this, I thought, you know, this is kind of what Trump has done. He's taken two quick steps, and I'm going to talk about those. He hasn't done any long steps yet, major legislation or anything. But the important thing is, in the Texas two-step, you don't get to the long steps until you take the two short steps first. And I'm going to argue that he's done that. What's the first step? Uh, the first step is Trump's executive order released on March 28, uh, essentially saying we are going to, it is establishing that for the U.S., energy independence and economic growth are the key factors there. Uh, <clears throat> he said it is, in, it is uh, in the national interest of the country to promote the development of the nation's uh, vast energy resources and immediate review of all agencies across the, uh, across the uh, look for burden of, safe, of burden of the safe, efficient development of energy resources. The first one sort of set the tone for the administration in the country. The second one begins to say, here's the actions we're going to take. It initiates the actions. So I would argue that's the, the first step the president's taken. Second step. Opening doors instead of closing doors. Um, begin with pipelines. On January 27, uh, he assigned an executive order saying Dakota Access Pipeline, Keystone Pipelines, those things can go forward. Uh, it was interesting because, if you remember, there was such a discussion in the country about the Keystone Pipeline. Um, the key, it was the Keystone XL pipeline. Actually, the Keystone XL was the fourth phase in the Keystone pipeline process in which, back in 2008 or 9, they actually finished the first phase of it. It went from the same place, Alberta, Canada, across some provinces, down into Nebraska, and then went over to Illinois, 
Barack Obama's home state for refining there in his home state. The second phase went from Nebraska down to Cushing, Oklahoma. The third phase went from Cushing, Oklahoma down to Texas, uh, to the Texas Gulf for refining. And Barack Obama in 2012 went to Cushing, Oklahoma to talk about what a great new pipeline this was going to be. The Keystone XL was the same pipeline. It was just taking a shortcut from the exact same place, uh, uh, channeling the exact same oil that he was so upset about and getting it down to Texas refineries. So Barack, uh, President Trump came in, made that change. Number two, he, uh, uh, he uh, allowed us to start leases. We, in February, he allowed us to start uh, leasing on uh, federal lands offshore the largest oil and uh, gas lease sale we've had in history. And in the third one, refineries, he is relaxing the renewable fuel standards. The re renewable fuel standards, that's where you have to, uh, refineries have to mix in ethanol, mostly made from corn, into our gasoline so that most of us drive around with 10% of ethanol in our gas tanks. Um, there are, that's becoming a struggle for some refineries, and uh, he gave, he relaxed some of those to uh, allow those to continue on. It's an important aspect for Texas because I think we refine about 30% of the uh, crude oil in the country here. So, what does the new sheriff in town mean for the Texas economy? So let's look at just some of the things. I wanted to kind of try to give you an idea of how much what our role is in producing crude oil and ga natural gas compared to the rest of the country. So Texas produces 3.5 million barrels per day of crude oil. If you add in offshore, that's off in the Gulf, you add in 1.6 million barrels per day. The second largest crude oil producer in the country is North Dakota. It produces about 1 million barrels per day. So we actually just own land. We produce about three and a half times what North Dakota does. If you add in the Gulf, we're up around uh, five times what the second producer in crude oil is. On natural gas, Texas produces uh, 6.37 trillion cubic feet. That's 2016. Um, of natural gas, and we, uh, that's about 25% of the total production in the U.S. Second largest state, Pennsylvania, 5.25 trillion cubic feet. Oklahoma, 2.29 trillion cubic feet. And Texas leads in lignite coal production. We're the largest producer of lignite coal. So, what does all this energy do for the Texas economy? Houston Chronicle, um, back in January, oil manufacturing will change, will, uh, will energize Texas economy in 2018. You can see what the, some of the comments from the, uh, from the article here, but right down here at the last, Texas drillers have steadily put more rigs into operation over the past year, increasing the state's rig count by nearly 40% to 454 rigs. What does it mean for jobs in Texas? This comes from the Dallas Fed, your old home. Um, you're looking, oil and gas extraction is the next is last one. You may not be able to see it since it's kind of small. It's a small percentage of the workforce, but look at where the employment growth is out there. 26% in just the first quarter of the year. Prices are going up, and they're hiring in that. So, everything's good, right? We're doing well. Well, here comes the maybe. What about the potential trade war that could happen to us? Uh, price increases are already beginning to happen. 17% of our electricity generation comes from wind energy. That uses a lot of steel. That steel is already uh, getting hit by tariffs. Uh, steel tariffs are also raising the cost of oil pipelines. There are some, some of the oil pipelines, as I understand, we don't even produce, the steel for that, we don't even produce here. We don't have the mechanism to do that. They produce it offshore. And so we have to pay those higher tariffs if it's going to come from, if it comes from China. And then, of course, the, uh, the uh, steel casing for uh, the drilling is, uh, is going to be hit by the steel tariffs. That's already in effect. What about our exports on oil? This uh, shows the starting out with 100% back in uh, to December 2015. The blue line shows you the increase in exports of crude oil in the U.S. 
red line shows you the increase in exports of crude oil in Texas, significantly topping uh, what, the, uh, what the U.S. does in terms of our percentage there. We've increased, what, uh, about 800 percent, 900 percent over, over that period of time in exporting crude oil. So who wants our um, oil and natural gas? Well, most of it right now goes to Mexico and Canada, mostly through pipelines. But China is the second largest importer of liquefied natural gas in the world. It is the third largest importer of Texas liquefied natural gas. China plays a big role, and they are trying to import even more liquefied natural gas which is what we're bringing, what we're trying to produce now and, and uh, export. So how much money are we talking about? The Census Bureau actually tracks this. What does the U.S. oil and gas exploration to China, how much money do we make from that? There's crude oil, fuel oil, uh, other petroleum products. There's a lot of liquids we get out of petroleum. Natural gas liquids, that's, there's liquids that we extract from that, and then the natural gas would be our liquid, liquefied natural gas. Look at what we were exporting from the U.S. in uh, 2015. Totaled up about $2.4 billion for that year. Come to 2017, we're up to nearly $9 billion, more than uh, tripling what we've done in just those three years. So, the challenge. Trump's targets for his tariffs are mostly political. That is, he's listening to companies that are saying, oh, these people aren't treating us fair over here, so we need to, we need to do something to stop what they're doing. Uh, China has got a different strategy. They're being strategic in their tariffs. They aren't asking the question, what, country, what companies in the U.S. Are, uh, do we think are being uh, manipulating trade, doing things incorrectly, or uh, so forth, and then going to target those? They're asking, where can we hurt the U.S. and President Trump the hardest? So normally you would say they wouldn't put any uh, tariffs on U.S. or limits on U.S. oil and natural gas, but they're not targeting it because of that. They would be targeting it strategically, and if you're doing it strategically, you can hit the U.S., which would hit Texas very hard, now, these are commodities, so they can be shipped to other places, but um, it, it's awfully good to have that market available out there. So if the trade war ensues, the Texas economy could be hit harder than other states. Conclusion. Uh, Trump's support for the energy industry and uh, regulatory restraint could significantly benefit the Texas economy, but his trade war saber-rattling could undermine most of that, if not all of that benefit, of the two steps forward. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Now, I'd like to ask our speakers to take their position up here in one of the seats, and we'll get uh, warmed up with some good Q&A. And while they're doing that, I want to recognize Liz Chow with the O'Neill Center. She is really the one that put this whole program together and has done all the operations work. Let's thank her. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Microphone's on. Did you, do we have enough? Okay. 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 Questions, if you would, uh, if you have one for a particular speaker, uh, identify that speaker. Otherwise, uh, throw it out for the, uh, for the whole panel. Who's going to be first? Anyone? Yes, absolutely. Step right up to the microphone. Gentlemen, uh, my name is Grant Wolf. I'm a senior finance student uh, and the chairman of the... Uh, I think it is. Just hold it close. Okay. Um, I'm a senior finance student, um, and I was curious about, we. It, you talked, all of you, about how uh, 
the trade deficit or balance is not necessarily the best measure of trade success with another country. Um, I know the Trump administration has also talked some about their concerns for market access for American companies to uh, particularly China. So what would you suggest are some more beneficial measures uh, besides tariffs to help improve market access for American companies to those countries? Anyone want to jump in there? Well, you're right. We, we have a balance of trade deficit with China. Um, the other things that the president has been looking at is technology transfer, we call tech transfer, and intellectual property protections. Uh, the, and, and my understanding from some companies is that really is an issue, that China says, if you want to come and uh, work in our, and, and sell in our country, you've got to merge with one of our, with one of our companies or create an association, uh, an association relationship. But then that company says, you've got to give us your various technology that we can then work with, and then they take it and use it. So uh, companies have been very upset about that, and there are some areas where that can be addressed, I think. China is increasingly uh, filing more patents. Typically, a developing country tends to want to steal intellectual property. A developed country wants to protect intellectual property. China is sort of making that transition now. They're saying they want to be better on that. We don't know if that's actually the case or if they will. But uh, addressing those two areas would be, I think, a significant plus for us. And that's sort of outside of the whole balance of trade issue. I would simply add, if we, Trump has said, his initial statement said he'd like to see the reduction of $100 billion um, from our trade deficit a year. He just a couple of days ago said $200 billion, but let's go with this $100 billion. So we're already, they're already buying nearly $9 billion a year from us in energy. So I would argue that one of the things China could say is over five years, we're going to ramp that up. It's a commodity. You can buy it from us. You can buy it from somebody else. So we're not going to take Iran's oil now because they're on sanctions. We're going to buy U.S. oil and natural gas over five years and maybe cut that deficit, that $100 billion, in half just by doing that. Uh, um, is it on? All right. Um, one thing I ought to mention, too, is that these businesses also have some sovereignty. They could choose not to go there. If we understand that they're going to take the intellectual property, why don't they choose not to go? Um, in addition to that, I think that it's important for Trump administration not to go in and say, okay, we're going to have a tariff, because that looks like it could lead to some sort of a trade war with China as they do this tit for tat. Okay, we're going to do $50 billion. They're going to do $50 billion worth of tariffs. And we're going to do $150 billion. With $150 billion there, well, at the end of the day, consumers, Americans are going to be hurt throughout that process. Instead, what we should do is look at ways to reduce the cost of doing business here at home. We can't force another country to, to whatever they're going to do with their economic policy, but what we do have some control over is what the economic policy that we have here in the U.S. Um, and so that's something I would consider. I, I think I just add, there was a cartoon in the Wall Street Journal the other day when you're talking about what, why companies will go there if they have to do that. The cartoon in the journal said uh, there was two businessmen looking at a contract and he said, you know, if we do this, we're going to burn in hell. On the other hand, it's an awful lot of money. <laughs> And what I think I would say that a number of these companies say that's the fastest growing and largest economy. Well, it's not the largest, it's the second largest economy, but it's got the most people there. It is the biggest economy for them. And if you're a major company, Caterpillar and others, you want to be there. If you're a car manufacturer, you want to be there. They want to be there because the market's just too big. But on the other hand, so they, they, may, they may have trouble, but it's an awful lot of money. So given that we need... Mexican labor, what's a sensible way to handle that input of Mexican labor in terms of an immigration policy? And do we care whether it's legal or illegal? And I'd like to ask Michael Cox to answer that and then one other, uh, whoever wants to tackle that one. Um, do we care? Did everybody hear the question? What's a sensible way to have a, a Mexican immig an immigration policy relative to Mexico? Uh, and do we care whether the immigration is legal or illegal? I think we very much care whether it's legal or illegal, because when nations make laws 
and government allows people to break the laws, and especially if government breaks the laws themselves, there's a general degradation in the rule of law. Uh, that's what's wrong with a lot of Latin America is that when you break the law, if you have enough money to pay off the judge, the law doesn't apply to you. And, you know, it, that just doesn't work for an economy, especially a large economy like the United States. In fact, that's why they leave their country to come here is because we, we the rule of law by and large still does work. And um, so, I mean, I'm absolutely for making laws which for abiding by the law and which means on this on the freeways they need to raise the speed limit to 90 miles an hour which is how fast i travel <laughs> because i think that would be fine and so when it comes to a sensible immigration policy i believe we we, we need to relax the uh the restrictions on immigrants coming to this country but not just on the ones coming from mexico but on the number coming from large countries like like India, there, we don't have enough, the quotas don't allow enough countries, relatively speaking, to come from large countries as, as they do from small ones. And um, so I think that the approach is to have much more legal immigration and then enforce the law. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Okay. I, I, well, I will sort of going along with what you said. The um, If it were me, I would have a robust immigration policy that allowed a lot of people to come. They would have to pay several thousand dollars to come in. They're giving that to coyotes now anyway. So give it to us and use that to offset any of the costs that are there. But then uh, let them go back and forth. If you could come in for like a three-year term or something like that, you get to come here. I would have them uh, file a uh, – have to buy a private sector bond like a person who is released from jail if they don't show up after the end of that the bondsman comes after them the bondsman has an economic incentive to get that person and get get control of them and 40 percent of the people that we have over here illegally are people who've overstayed their visas so uh, i would do something like that but the one thing i wouldn't do is allow them to use that as a way to say we're coming over having babies they're all citizens now you got to keep us I'd sort of address that issue, um, but that's a tough one to address. Many people who have negotiated for business uh, for years know that sometimes the first point of negotiation is uh, your current deal is a bad deal. So the folks talked about Trump on NAFTA and, and uh, tariffs. How much do you think his position on those issues is just negotiation or is it real about wanting to change the system? I'm hopeful that most of it is about negotiating a better deal, right? Um, the The problem is, though, is that leads to uncertainty within the marketplace. And as as we know, is that entrepreneurs aren't looking at the past like government does. They're looking at the future and how they can profit within the economy. And so if you're leading to an economic uncertainty through policy changes such as tariffs, or I would say even with the NAFTA negotiations, um, that leads to a lot of, 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 of allocations of resources that aren't going to be used most efficiently. And, and so, yeah. Bring up that point, yeah. About the people on the border. Oh, yeah. So um, earlier today, I had a lunch with some CEOs, some Hispanic CEOs here in Dallas who, have, who do a lot of work along the border. And some of their business is done on the Mexican side of the border. And so they already see that this is affecting their business because they, they, they can't make those profitability decisions. They don't know what their costs are going to be. Right, and so they've already slowed down their investment. They've slowed down their job creation. Whenever it was increasing quite rapidly last year, they saw it boost up when regula regulations were being reduced. Tax reform happened, but now through some of these um, uncertain events that are happening from from NAFTA, um, they've definitely slowed down their job creation. I think it's even shown within the numbers the last two months. Um, job creation was 103,000 in February before they revised it, or I guess it was March actually, and then in April was 164,000, which was about 30,000 below expectations. So I think that there is some of that that's already happening of the slowdown in the econ or slowdown in job creation than what otherwise would have been. And, um, one more comment on this: How many people here are familiar with Lopez Obrador? Okay. Mexico's prob probable next new president from the left. Well, 
the likelihood of him being elected goes up every day, every time Trump puts the national wants to push the national guard at the border, does his other another immigration thing, another anti another trade thing, and uh, so that that's another un, kind of hidden outcome. Well, not hidden, but unknown, un, uh, underlooked. Oh, that's not the word for it. Outcome of this whole back and forth blustering. What's the truth? I don't know. Policy uncertainty. It's certainly speeding up the process because they're doing what's called fra fra uh, fast track right now to go through the NAFTA negotiations. So basically the executive branch can make the negotiations happen. And then after that, they'll have what's called the Trade Protection Authority, which lasts 90 days, and then they can vote. Well, during these 90 days, they've got to get something done as quickly as possible before hopefully the July 1st presidential elections in Mexico. Well, and also on sort of the idea of this is maybe a negotiating ploy. The, the problem, there are a couple problems there. If, if you are in a business executive, you're, you have so much uncertainty about what, what's the lay of the land going to be. Can you go build a factory somewhere because there's, you, don't know, you don't know how this is going to play out. So this creates so much uncertainty, you don't know what to do with your capital expenditures. But also this issue with uh, NAFTA. So Trump makes, the, uh, you know, makes uh, the, the bluster, your word, uh, about possibly pulling out. So, and now it looks like that we may be sort of trying to race to a c conclusion with it without necessarily necessarily any great change from what I'm seeing, but the whole world is watching this. So if we're now negotiating with China, and we've made this bluster um, with, with, with Canada and Mexico, and frankly, if Donald Trump gets rolled by Justin Trudeau, how, you know, how does that make him look as this great deal maker when he's trying to negotiate with China? Yes, sir. I'm uh, Jim Ratchford with Texas Concilium. So each of you have imparted a great deal of knowledge for us, and I appreciate that. Thinking of the business leaders and owners that might now have this knowledge, what actions do they take as a result of knowing this that they might not have done before? Anybody want to take that one? Um, I mean, a, a part of that would be contact your representative, contact your, your U.S. senator. Um, but but uh, it's continuing to share the information as much as possible. That's one reason why I was excited that my Cox um, invited me to be here to explain this. And, and we just had a paper come out on NAFTA and the and, and the benefits that we've had. But we can need to continue to have the, um, hit on that message. There's there's a lot of things that are out there. I mean, we've we've understood that mercantilism hasn't worked for a long time, but yet we're still in that mindset that trade deficits are a cost. Right, and that we need to have uh, more exports over imports, sort of deal. Um, and, and so I, I think, really, is to, to make sure to share the information and um, contact your your elected officials, so they can put pressure on them as well. Your local officials, in particular. When I mean local, I mean right here in Texas. Your governor, your lieutenant governor, your attorney general. All the hate that seems to be coming out the coming out of the government of this state toward immigrants and toward, you know, the people. It's just, you know, go start at home here, and um, you have, maybe you have a better chance of those people listening anyway. hold off making those decisions and investments now because you don't know whether or not you will be the next target. Remember, Trump's doing it based upon grievances. China's doing it strategically. And if, he, if other, country, other, other countries follow China's rule, uh, you could be a company that has, no, I mean, that has no real impact. I mean, you're not doing something. Nobody accuses you of, of uh, uh, doing malpractice in trade, but you could get hit. Uh, so I think I'd say uh, hold off. And the problem with that is, from the Republican standpoint, back in January with the tax bill coming through, they thought, man, we're, we're liable to be able to fight this blue wave because the economy's going to look so good in November. It may not look that good if businesses start holding off and not doing that investment, and you could push us towards a recession, if not in a recession. I, I believe that most of us on this panel, and I, and I, I would like to know about y'all too, feel that Texas probably has more to lose 
from from, the, from these Trump policies than other states, than any other state. Probably more to gain from the good ones. More to gain from the... From the tax breaks and some of the oh, things. Oh, okay. So we're on the bubble here, one way or the other. Do you all feel that way? Yes, sir. Appreciate the... Uh, all the information that was provided this evening to us, and especially uh, how much uh, our nation depends on uh, immigrant labor. I think that was very educational. Certainly appreciate it. I'm Ed Rincon, by the way. I'm, I'm a, one of the scholars for the uh, Tower Center here at SMU. But I've also had a consulting practice for 40 years that targets uh, multicultural communities in the US. The important thing about what you're saying is that uh, as a state and as a nation, we're highly dependent on immigrant labor in a number of, of industries. But the situation, if we were to believe the projections that the Census Bureau just released just this past month about the projections of the Latino population and how it's going to shake out up to the year 2060, then the situation is going to become dire and even more bleak than it is right now because the vast majority of the growth in the future are going to be from native-born Latinos and the, the presence of the immigrant uh, population is going to nosedive much further than it is right now. So the implications for businesses is dire as well. It's very bleak, especially for those businesses that have uh, developed uh, a positioning to sell services sell products to uh, especially the immigrant uh, component of this community. I guess I'm, uh, I'm basically uh, making a statement and making a reaction, but I'm more interested in knowing what do you think the business community should be doing during this time? Because as you mentioned, it's been a very hostile, very hostile environment uh, towards immigrants. And that's one of the reasons why so many of them have returned to their home countries and not that many of them are coming back in. Well, the numbers on that, and we learned this when I was in Mexico City last week, uh, are that there's net outward, net out migration of Mexicans now from the United States. There's net, still net in migration of Mexicans to Texas from other states. So people are leaving the Mexicans, a lot of Mexican labor force are leaving other parts of America and coming to Texas. So we still enjoy the net positive net immigrant flow. But the Americas, you know, the hostilities and maybe some better opportunities at home. I, I don't. It's a long, it's it's a long, complicated picture to look at the whole thing. Uh, but there's net outward flow of migration now. I have 100% Mexican DNA. Uh, my father hitchhiked here from Mexico when he was 17 years old. Learned to speak English in the United States Army. I love Texas. Is is it not on? It's on. Okay. Uh, I love Texas. I've made a lot of money thanks to NAFTA. Uh, here's my question. What aspects of NAFTA can we improve? What, what about it needs tweaking? What, what would be a best case scenario outcome? Thank you. I think that's a great question. And it, it's one of the lines that I usually like to make about NAFTA that I forgot. To, to me, um, free trade agreement should really only be one sentence. No trade barriers between countries X, Y, and Z, or U.S., Canada, and Mexico, like period. That, that to me, should be the free, a free trade agreement. Um, unfortunately, NAFTA is 1,700 pages. That, that's a lot of sentences. Right, there's there's a lot of sentences, and and NAFTA is by no means perfect. I, I hope I didn't come off to mean that it, uh, or indicate that it's perfect. There is a lot of things in there that could be changed. Um, I think part of it that could be improved um, would be to add private property rights in there, which would allow for economic freedom to flourish, and part of that being with energy. When we talked about Oberdor maybe coming in, and um, he could nationalize the energy sector again. That's going to be very difficult to do, but he could to get back to Pemex again, right? And if they did that, what would happen to the oil and gas companies who have infrastructure in Mexico now? They, they would lose it, 
right? So maybe there's a way within NAFTA to allow for private property rights um, within that particular sector. And there are other, other things too, but right now with the, the discussion, I don't know if you've seen recently, uh, but now the Trump administration is saying that the auto manufacturing companies need to pay, in, in Mexico, need to pay $16 an hour. Right? And there's also the parts of origin. So if you have a, a, a vehicle um, today, it has to be about 62% of that vehicle has to be put together here in the, in the U.S., produced here in the U.S. Um, they want to raise that up to 75%. And Mexico came back and said, hey, look, what about 70? And now it, that's where the discussion is happening. Right? So these, this, at the end of the day, will still mean higher costs for consumers which means slower economic growth and these things over time. And so I think it's something really to look at. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that could be improved upon, but are we moving more towards protectionism, which I'm worried about, or are we moving more towards freer trade? Freer trade would be the best path. Uh, be, be sure that you look for our next annual report from the O'Neill Center. It will be our ninth or 10th, I can't remember. And the name of it will be Texico, which is the combination of Texas and Mexico. What would it be like if everything went right, or just as a, you know, from what would it be like if we could trade as freely here in Texas with Mexico as we can with Arkansas, Oklahoma, and all the other states in America? Imagine what that would do for both places. Imagine the freedom of labor across the borders that we have between Arkansas and Texas now, if we had it between nations. Imagine the freedom. Just imagine it, you know, we don't, that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure that out. And I would just add, if you, the accusation is made that NAFTA has destroyed our manufacturing sector, but if you go to the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank and you look at manufacturing jobs, you will find manufacturing jobs continue to increase after NAFTA for the next six or seven years, up to about the time we hit that 2000 or so recession, they started going down, it never actually, uh, went up above that, uh, it continued to go down for the most part, but I'd argue that's mostly due to technology coming in. And, uh, and, and the high cost of unions, high cost of taxes, those again, those are domestic policies that are in place. When you look at the research too, I mean, NAFTA has contributed to about 5 million, at least 5 million jobs. So there wasn't, no, there wasn't a giant sucking sound as Ross Perot was famously said um, from, from NAFTA and the economy has continued to expand as well. Last question. Actually, you were uh, touching on something I was just thinking about is I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall with you in Mexico having that discussion because are there some common areas of agreement outside of what you're talking about? For example, um, the drug epidemic here, you know, if there was some way that uh, the U.S. and Mexico could, could somehow find a way to, to stem that tide of illegal drugs coming up. Uh, the, the second thing, I, I know a lot of people... Uh, lump a lot of the Central Americans and South Americans are, are uh, coming in as Mexican, and they're not. They're from other countries, but uh, they they flow through through Mexico to to the U.S. I was just wondering if there's you know anything that came up in a discussion, or do you see anything of areas of compromise like that that everyone can agree on? Uh, comments. Well, I wish you had been a fly on the wall. You could ask the question to the presenters down there. It's a very good question. You know, the, I'm not the best resource on that. There's a lady in town here named Pia Arrhenius, who's, who, who I think is what probably I would, if, I, if she were here, I would say, Pia, you know, what, what are the answers to these questions? I can try to get Dallas them. Dallas Fed, right? She's at the Dallas Fed. She's the Dallas, Dallas Fed, right. Um, the drug problem, is, a, is it a supply problem or a demand problem? I mean, wherever there's demand, and if you try to put a restriction on it, it just drives up the price. And then, when you drive up, when you when you try to limit, if you try to solve the drug problem by limiting the supply, things on the supply side, you drive up the price. And the only kind of people who are willing to get in the industry and risk going to jail are the ones that are already crooks, and they don't have nothing nothing to lose. And so they're going to get involved in drug and trafficking and and everything else. And so, they, our our own policy in America here. Uh, it's been, you know, every time the, the government has a war on something, it's a total failure. The war on drugs was a total failure. Um, war on poverty has been a total failure. <laughs> because obviously, I've got to go pretty far here. The government has no interest in solving problems. They have an interest in savoring problems and, create, and surrounding them with big bureaucracies. And that's what happens. Yeah. What about the 
up that question, uh, extending that about uh, uh, embracing Central American countries into NAFTA. There's some talk about you know, the emerging nations of uh, Panama and Costa Rica, which are really economic powerhouses right now. Should they come into NAFTA? Should we extend the umbrella of NAFTA? Sure, why not? I mean, th that's part of the Central American Free Trade Agreement, right? And so some of them have already been included. Um, and there's still a discussion as well about even having some of the South American countries be a part of that as well. Um, look, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, free trade among individuals between us, we satisfy our desires. The same thing is true. Why does it matter if it's across a border? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it does matter. So the freer trade that we can have, the lower cost of doing business, um, the better off that we're going to be. I will say, though, that the current president is a, is a bigger fan of bilateral trade than multilateral trade yeah. negotiations. Uh, and, and for the reason he feels like we're the biggest economy in the world, we can extract more concessions if it's just us talking to them. So I would be actually for the notion of other countries being able, South American countries, uh, Latin American being able to move in that. But I don't know if it, I don't know if that gets past this particular president. Oh. <laughs> oh. So uh, one of the things I was going to mention was that uh, I spent last week at a uh, energy conference in Houston um, called the Offshore Technology Conference. And the best way to describe uh, OTC, there's about 61,000 people there. And as I walked around, um, one of the things that was striking to me is everything's made of steel. So the, this is a technology conference, and so everything is drilling equipment, giant machinery. Um, and, and it didn't have, uh, there actually, even though it was an offshore technology conference, there even were frack trucks. Um, it was not um, uh, midstream, so there wasn't any pipelines there. But um, it's, it's amazing just how much steel goes into energy. And uh, one of the tweets that I was uh, about to put up was uh, a tweet about a week ago um, from President Trump saying, OPEC's at it again. Again, they're artificially making oil prices very high. And I tell you what would make oil prices artificially high is steel tariffs because it's going to affect so many, so many companies um, and people that I talk to within the industry, different aspects of the industry, uh, upstream, midstream, downstream, you know, EPC projects. Uh, projects are jeopardized. Um, there are some very large projects that um, that we, we have clients that are saying, look, if, if there's tariffs, if we can no longer project steel prices um, in the future, if we expect you know a run on steel prices, the project itself may go offline. Um, and so I'm hearing that from clients in construction, but a lot of clients in energy, different aspects of energy, they're very concerned. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty just about about steel tariffs. Let's thank our speakers, our panelists.